Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the CEU Executive MBA um, Tel Aviv Online Open Day. I'm Thomas Lamel, the Senior Program Manager of CEU Executive MBA, and I will guide you through this evening. We will start with a program presentation delivered by me. Afterwards, we will talk um, with Agnes Schramm, one of our alumni, about the alumni experience. You will have the opportunity to uh, get to know Anita Jovic, one of our current participants. Um, after the um, uh, meet and greet part, um, our VIP guest, Professor Miklos Koren, will deliver his keynote presentation on expat managers in international trade. Um, if you have, uh, and after that, we will have a Q&A session about your questions. If you have any questions um, that could pop up spontaneously, feel free to just shoot them in the chat box. I will collect them for the Q&A session in the end, but feel free to uh, interact with us through the chat and the, um, the chat box and the Q&A part. So if you are, I want to start with a basic question here. Um, that is, is an MBA still worth it? Because you don't have to go very far these days to encounter that we are witnessing fundamental transformations in the world in a century. In 2008, we had a big financial crisis, for example. In 2015, we've had a large refugee crisis. And right now, we are experiencing the biggest pandemic in a century. And these changes are part of a much broader set of transformation that is taking place. Some of them are positive and some of them are pretty dangerous, to be honest. So the key question is, how do we as business professionals, how do you as business professionals prepare for this challenging and unpredictable environment? And the next obvious question is, is an MBA the way to do it? We have seen an explosion of online education in the last uh, year, and I'll show you why we believe our MBA is still worth it. So if you're interested in further education, you usually start searching for an executive MBA or an MBA in the city you live in. What you tend to find is mostly um, a pretty standard MBA curriculum. Um, the faculty is uh, mostly local with a low number of international students, actually. Some programs in, the, in Western Europe and uh, the UK and uh, the USA can be quite expensive, starting at 100,000 euro or dollars or even more expensive than that. Um, but a local program allows you to leave uh, your job. If you contrast that with top business schools in the world, which are mostly in the US or uh, in Switzerland or the UK, what you will find is that they often have a very differentiated curriculum. That means they offer a very a certain expertise and a certain perspective or a certain mission. Because of the, the full-time format, their student body is international actually. But you're leaving the labor market for at least one year or even two years, which is another financial burden. Um, speaking of financial burden, these programs are expensive at more than 120,000 euro or even more. And you may have to move your family to the EMBA location. So what we do at CU is to offer the best of two worlds. There is no work interruption thanks to the practical and flexible modular format. I will talk about it in a while. The Executive MBA is mission-driven. As you've seen from our website, it's called the Executive MBA for the open world. I will talk about it later. Thanks to the modularity of the program, we have a very international student body. According to the Times Higher Education, we are the second most international university in the world. And thanks to this modular format, participants can fly in and can fly out which is a major advantage of the program. I already mentioned um, world-class faculty, and I want to introduce you to some of our faculty members. For example, Joy. If you're new to finance, Joy is a uniquely gifted educator. Generation after generation of our students 
tell us how she's just unique in explaining very concept, very complex financial concepts. Or for strategy, you'll have Yusa, who has taught more in more than 40 countries and advises leading Fortune 500 companies. For economics, for example, Mark Kaufmann, an expert in applied theory with a PhD from Harvard University. Or our faculty director, um, Professor Maciej Kishlowski, who's an expert on regulation and non-market strategy. Um, we also have Sofia Barani, an expert on the future of work, which uh, includes automation, artificial intelligence, and robotics. For leadership, Austin, our world-class psychologist with executive education experience on four continents, he will lead the way. And if you're already experienced in finance, you'll be pleased, you will, you'll be placed in the advanced track course with Adam Savadovsky, a leading expert in complex uh, investments with a PhD from Princeton. And last but not least for innovation, you'll have Mike Labelle, who holds a prestigious EU Jean Monnet chair. And here are some of our uh, visiting faculty, for example, Professor Christian Zelos from Stanford, Miklos Savary from Columbia, Omar Hernandez from Berkeley, Hui Chen from Zurich, and Milena Nikolova, the Chief Behavior Officer of Behavior Smart. So here's what the program looks like. It's a 10 module program, as you can see. The dates you can see on the screen right now are not going to change. So you can basically plan your studying around professional or family activities based on these dates. As you can clearly see from the chart, we have three modules in the first year, four in the second year, and three in the third year, which gives you a lot of flexibility and balance in your life. As you have might found out, we are piggybacking around popular European holidays like November 1st or August 15th or May 1st, when it's easier for you to take time off for our modules. In the summers, our bespoke and cutting edge leadership program takes place in Budapest and you'll have the opportunity to benefit from electives from the faculty in the world we invite to teach your classes. Once you are graduating, once you have completed the modular format, there will come eventually the day when you finish with us and you will join the CEU alumni network from around the world. As I already said, CEU is the second most international university and you can rely on an active elite network on every continent. Being the second most international university in the world is being reflected in the distribution and the allocation of our alumni all over the world. We have city level chapters, we have country level chapters. Basically, wherever you are in the world, wherever you go in the world, wherever your life leads you, you will find CEU alumni to interact with. And the CEU alumni network consists of 18,000 professionals around the world. And it's a network that you can count on. And it's basically one of the key assets that we have. So the key question is, how are we able to offer such a high quality program? The obvious answer lies in our benefactor and in, our, in the founder of CEU in George Soros, who created Central European University uh, with the mission to promote open societies. Just recently in 2021, George Soros made an, another contribution, a further contribution to CEU's mission by offering another billion dollars in endowment to create the Open Society University Network, which means we are the best endowed university in Europe. So I've mentioned that, I've mentioned that we are a mission-driven university. I've mentioned the executive MBA for the open world, but what does the executive MBA for the open world actually mean? What makes CEU so unique? First of all, when we talk about open world, we mean skepticism towards dogmas, towards hierarchies and privileges, both in context of how we teach, 
but also in context of the composition of the cohort. Diversity is key to creating a successful program and it's part of our DNA and not just an empty catchphrase for us. Secondly, we believe in debate and radical rational thinking. That means that every idea can be challenged. We believe in facts and arguments rather than narratives and fake news because it's narratives that cre create polarization in societies nowadays. And we believe that the best way to challenge this narrative-based uh, discourse is to make arguments based on facts and realities, which is the hallmark of Karl Popper's definition of open societies. Um, following that logic, we are fundamentally opposed to all kinds of discrimination and we actively promote diversity within our program. The way we finance the scholarship means we create opportunities for people who traditionally did not have um, access or did not have been able to actually join the executive MBA program. And we see managers, not just as people who deal with businesses or resources, but we also believe that managers go beyond that. We see uh, managers as positive change agents, whatever their professional background is. If they're corporate people, if they're entrepreneurs, if they're climate change activists, if they're coming from the public sector, if they're artists coming from, cultural, cult, from the cultural field, or if they're uh, from the um, human rights uh, uh, field, they are positive change agents and can make the world a little bit better. So what does the CEU executive MBA classroom look like? As you can see from um, the image, um, we use state-of-the-art classroom technology and setups in order to facilitate discussion and interaction um, of our 65 managers who have a, the average of 14 years of work experience, of which um, three years are uh, leadership experience at least. We make use of case-based learning rather than traditional lectures that you will find in local MBA programs. And our mission, our approach is to take you experts in your specific field from this level of functional expertise to the strategic level. We also offer, if you, uh, top quality online experience, if you're not able to travel or if you don't want to travel, if it's too dangerous for you to travel because of corona restrictions or whatever you can join uh you can choose to join online it's a flexible approach you can join um you can basically choose at every module if you want to participate offline or online we invested heavily in studio um great microphones for um to capture lecturers and all participants because it's not a one-way street um, exchanging knowledge is not just a one-way street going from the lecturer to the participant to the student. It only it also takes place from the student to the lecturer and among participants themselves. We have invested in large uh, large screens and high quality cameras to actually um, catch all the uh, debate uh, uh, entries that are being made during discussions, and we have created physical virtual breakout rooms for support teams. The support teams are a core essential part of the group work that will be taking place um, within all the modules that, you're, uh, that you will be doing. And we guarantee diversity in all the support teams. You will not be placed in a support teams with people coming from the same country, speaking the same language, being in the same industry, et cetera, because we want to expose you to diversity not just for diversity's sake itself, but because diversity exposes you to different backgrounds and to different perspectives. And this is where learning takes place. This is where learning really kicks in. If you're exposed to new ideas and new approaches, this is where diversity, where the strength of diversity kicks in. And of course, we also, we, all the time, we offer high quality individual support from the stage of application, to the onboarding phase, to the phase where you're participant in, 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 in the program, 
to the um, when your module when you're part of the modules and um, to the alumni phase you will we are always here for you and you will always have high quality individual support um, this is just an example of our one of our uh, uh, group sessions as you can see um, you can have all the names you can see all the names of people contributing to the debate you can see the group um, the groups uh, colored uh, uh, determined by the colors so you won't be um, missing out any debate entries while you're interacting with your fellow executives so we invite you to join the open world um, the application um, um, starts online. Um, we offer um, a competitive program at 29,000 euro, which is um, pretty competitive, pretty relatively low compared to other programs in the region. But there's a specific reason be, that I already mentioned. Because of our financial endowment, we are passing on this financial endowment, this financial um, advantage to our participants because we want to democratize higher education. And we don't want to price out people who are coming from less developed or less uh, or lower income countries. Um, as I already mentioned, we um, offer an online option. You can participate online if travel is inconvenient. We have negotiated special discount rates with partner hotels in Budapest and Vienna um, at, at all levels from the budget to the luxury level. We have also negotiated discounts with um, airlines like Austrian Airlines and Lufthansa Group in order to uh, reduce other costs that might occur if you participate in the executive MBA. So we want you to join the open world. Join us by applying for the program by March 27, which is our deadline, the application deadline. However, I strongly encourage you to apply as soon as, so, as soon as possible through our website because we have a first come first serve policy. So the sooner you apply, the sooner you're able to reserve your study seat. And if you're applying right now, you can um, secure a big early bird discount. We invite you to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me to discuss your questions on scholarships, on financial support, on the modular format, or just optimize your application. I'm here for you and I'm happy to help you. So it's one thing for you, I guess, to hear about the program from, from us, from the program office, because we are very much committed. We're passionate about the program and we're super convinced of the advantages and the strengths of the program. But it's another thing to hear about the program from uh, people who have actually done the program or are in the program uh, right now. So would like to introduce to you Agnes Schramm, who is um, the operations manager at the CEU Innovations Lab and an alumna of the executive MBA, the MBA back then. And I want to um, welcome you, Agnes. Thank you very much for joining. And if you could just briefly give us uh, some background on your career development and uh, why you chose CEU back then. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thanks for having me and hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Agnes Schramm. Um, uh, currently, I'm an operations manager at CU Innovations Lab, but actually, I've been working at CU for a very long time. <laughs> and um, uh, this is uh, where my story starts with the MBA as well. So I have a quiet untypical background uh, for a for an MBA student because I have a background in humanities. I studied uh, English and German language and linguistics, uh, which is really another world. Um, uh, but I started to work at CU um, a long time ago. Um, I was working in the uh, uh, in student recruitment. Uh, I started with admissions and then I moved on to student recruitment. First, I was uh, um, working with the bachelor's programs and then with the MBA. So um, after some time when I was working uh, uh, with the MBA program, recruiting students for the MBA program, I just felt um, the need 
to understand uh, the product <laughs> that I'm dealing with a little more, obviously. Um, I, I worked with wonderful people. I, I saw that, you know, these people who are applying to our MBA program are really uh, great uh, uh, people with, with vast amount of experience, great backgrounds. And um, I just wanted to somehow be closer to them um and and to be able to to talk about the mba to to present the mba from from the inside so um i decided to apply but for, of course for me it was uh um not easy because you know i was very afraid that you know with my background it's it's uh i i, I won't manage to do this because i was never good in maths and that's not my field so i prepared a lot <laughs> to be honest uh, but i had i had the advantage that i knew all the professors because i was working for them so i went to tibor Varish, who was teaching quantitative methods and so i told him okay tibor listen well you know me you work with me um you, you don't know anything about my math skills, <laughs> but I need some help uh, in this. So he gave me a book uh, with the just, you know, just basic math. And I started to go through that book. Uh, I didn't finish it. It was this thick. So I just <laughs> ran through the first few chapters, but that was enough. That was enough. Um, so um, that gave me confidence uh, enough to, to, to apply and to you know to uh, finish all the quantitative courses and I, I'm not saying that it was not difficult <laughs> because it was for me but I could manage and um, it really helped me this preparation of course those of you who have backgrounds in in finance or economics or whatever of course you won't need this but for me it was helpful and I just want to mention this to encourage those who have a similar background uh, as me so even uh, with a completely different uh, background you shouldn't be afraid to do an MBA um, uh, so and of course the uh, my classmates helped me a lot I had wonderful uh, classmates with um, from various countries uh, with, with, with various different experiences and those of uh, those uh, classmates who had you know that there were a lot who were really good in in, in maths and finance they had me a lot so I'm really uh, grateful for them uh, but the good experience is that I could have them as well uh, with my skills um, in different subjects uh, so this is this is actually I think what I would say what what is the main my main takeaway my my one of the most important experiences uh, from the MBA, how we learned from each other, uh, because I, I really feel that we learned from each other at least as much as we learned from the professors. Uh, so that was the great, that was the best experience. And, you know, the network, uh, all the friendships, all the connections I made uh, during the program, they are still alive today. And this is actually how I got to my current position, because when I did the MBA, uh, it, it was um, I started in 2014, finished in 2016. And the iLab, the Innovations Lab, which is the startup incubator of the university, was founded in 2015. And that's when uh, our current director, Andrea Cosma, also graduated from uh, the uh, EMBA, and she took over the iLab in 2016. And she built it up and she created the, um, uh, the incubation program that we have today. Um, and she asked me to join her <laughs> after a couple of years. So this is how I joined the iLab um, two, one, one and a half years ago. Um, and since then, I'm still um, using a lot of my uh, experiences that I, I learned in the MBA, especially uh, uh, my network, because we have many mentors in the ILAP who are CU MBA alumni, because they, they want to come back, they want to meet uh, new startups, they want to meet the younger generation and learn from them as well. They want to share their experiences um, uh, with the new generation of entrepreneurs and learn from them as well. So this is, uh, you know, a two-way 
uh, relationship and it works really nicely. You are the perfect example of how well our career development works and how well the network, <laughs> yeah. uh, the networking part uh, is. You, I think you mentioned, a, uh, like in the beginning, you mentioned a very important point that you did not have a business background. And I think this is very important for our MBA because many, many people of our current cohorts uh, come from a non-traditional, non-business background. They're NGO people or climate change activists or coming from the public sector. We also have people coming from the cult cultural field with applications coming in from arts. And I want to, I don't want to, to frighten off people because they fit into a program the same way as experienced people do. Because in, in the quantitative courses like finance, we have a standard track and an advanced track. So if you have any knowledge, of course, you will be placed in the advanced track. And if you don't have any knowledge, you will, you know, start at the very um, bottom, at, you know, at, at the very beginning, learning the ABC in financing. And, and uh, uh, so you don't have to be afraid of the MBA uh, just because of the business part. Um, I think that's very uh, uh, important to say that whatever, you know, whatever your strength is, you perfectly fit into the executive MBA at CEU. And you just mentioned the, the networking. I mean, um, we um, part of the networking at CEU is the career development, which is a whole department itself at CEU, which is open to um, CEU executive MBA participants, of course, if you need advice on career placement, if you need you know, career advice or, or concrete help in, in, in uh, uh, moving on in your career, you can reach out to the career development uh, office or you have the networking that takes place within the executive MBA, you know, at the structured and, and informal networking sessions. We also have our alumni relations department. If you want to have a more structured alumni approach, if you want to reach out to certain people uh, in a certain region, in, in a certain area, in a certain industry, in a certain city, um, they are happy to connect you and connect the dots. So um, you will be connected among 18,000 professionals around the world. And I think that's a huge asset that we have at, at CEU. Absolutely. Is, do you want to add something to it, uh, uh, Agnes? I, I think that's all. I think you, you summarized basically all my experience as well. <laughs> so I can all just only agree. Uh, and of course, if anyone has any questions to me, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share my experiences individually as well. So uh, Thomas, you can share my contacts um, uh, with the uh, inquirers and um, I wish the best of luck to anyone, everyone who is applying. Much. Thank you very okay. much for joining us, uh, your experience from the alumni perspective. I would like to move on to Anita, who is actually doing the program right now. Um, so he, she's not talking from the uh, retrospect perspective, but from the current perspective. Uh, just so you know, Anita Jovic is business consultant uh, and owner of Anado at AI. She's the founder of Artificial Intelligence Serbia. She's the co-founder, the, the co-managing partner of the Data Science Conference and venture partner of the Founder Institute and participant of the EMBA class of 23. Hi, Anita. Hi, Thomas. Thank you. Hope you can Thank hear you me. very much for joining us tonight. Um, if you could briefly introduce yourself and give, you know, give us some, some kind of background information, who you are and why you chose CEO Executive MBA back then. Thank you, Thomas, for your invitation. I want to say hi to everyone uh, that is listening and uh, from, you, you said quite a lot about what they do already, so I won't repeat myself. Uh, I'm quite immersed in uh, innovation uh, ecosystem in Serbia since 2014. I work with uh, 200 plus startups and small to medium sized companies. So I have more, let's say, experience on the innovation side. Um, I want to say why I joined the CU. I will separate it, let's say, in uh, five pillars. And uh, what you said and Agnes, I agree the most. So we, I learned uh, for my summer module a lot from my colleagues as well. So I said the first reason why I joined, it was more that is the international cohort. Uh, at the moment in 20, uh, 2023 uh, cohort, we have... Uh, people from 40 plus countries like Jason from Chicago, Suzanne from Finland, uh, 
Uh, Sandra is from Austria, uh, originally from Germany. So it's quite a diverse and inclusive group. And I love it the most, uh, uh, this, uh, this part. Uh, uh, why, why it is important? Because uh, people are uh, from different backgrounds and not only culture-wise, but uh, also um, uh, there is uh, people from corporations as well as entrepreneurs, then people from small to medium-sized companies. So we can quite a lot learn from each other. And when we are into the discussion during the lectures, uh, we can uh, bring the real use cases and the real like... Uh, things that are going on in our uh, separate industries and verticals, as well as uh, our background. So it is quite the important pillar for me. Uh, the second one will be like uh, price vs value, because in Serbia at the moment, uh, we only have one school that covers EMBA. And compared to uh, CU University, uh, CU has uh, more accreditations, so it is uh, you have the US accreditation as well as uh, Austria accreditation. And uh, compared to the price, uh, it, it is like, uh, let's say, um, a European price. Uh, and then I go into the third pillar, which will be the professors. Uh, what I love the most is when I look at the background of professors, you kind of get the uh, Ivy League professors for European price. And that is for me like was the biggest value to, to apply uh, to see you. And uh, also let's say, um, uh, for example, in on our summer module, what you did uh, beside all the professors, as you mentioned, like the professor J Joy Chan, she was outstanding. Uh, she is originally from Sydney, but she also lectures at uh, Swiss uh, University. So you get the top-notch professors uh, from different countries. And uh, for example, you, uh, the, what CU did, they think in so small details. For example, uh, they br brought the, uh, the professor from U.S., who was teaching us how to do the, the, the top-notch presentations. Uh, so it was part of leadership module. So even in that small details, you have uh, uh, the highest amount of value. And uh, also uh, every after every module, we give the evaluation to professors. So um, I think that the value of the diploma will just go up in my opinion, uh, because uh, CEU staff is doing a lot uh, to bring the quality and to listen to our evaluation and our feedback so they can improve for the next upcoming, upcoming cohort. So uh, I believe that um, why the professor uh, was really important uh, pillar for me to apply. Uh, the fourth one, uh, I be brief sorry uh, the fourth one is uh, that uh, enables me to stay focused on my job so it is part-time and I can plan ahead one year as Thomas said so the dates stay the same so I can play and shuttle the flights and everything so I can stay focused on my job and uh, this is like uh, additional value and investment in myself that uh, I can uh, um uh, advanced my education. So uh, the last one and the sure. fifth one. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Please go on. Mm -hmm. No, no problem. Uh, so the last one and the fifth one is the uh, uh, curriculum or the program. What I love the most is the that we have a preparation period, then we have the module and the exam period. So you can, um, everything except module is done remotely. And that is what I love the most because I can um, uh, interact with my colleagues, but in the same time stay connected with professors in a remote environment. And uh, also um, uh, why the curriculum is well structured is because it covers innovative subjects such as uh, AI. We have a data science, uh, data science module as well as strategy, as well as um, um, let's say fi finance is pretty important as i said joy really introduced us to how to invest into the um, stock market how to manage our assets as the leaders and managers of our companies so it is quite important that they cover this uh, 4.1 uh, industry subjects such as 
cybersecurity and uh, this is part of uh, additional like it's not the main in main module but uh, like uh, some of the 4.1 industries are covered in um, uh, Thomas can you help me it's called uh, electives right yeah because we we are uh, still didn't choose it uh, for this year, but uh, I think uh, it will be introduced to us uh, next year until the, the second module. And that's it, like that are the four pillars that, that four, five pillars, sorry, that uh, man, that uh, motivated me to, to apply for CU. And just for end, I would just say, please don't wait the end moment because uh, I was the one that applied the last day. So it, it, it just, uh, it's just better for you to apply as soon as possible because uh, in the end, I will need to, to pay more just because I was late. Uh, and uh, thank you, I got the, the fellowship as well. So I was really grateful. But for example, if I applied one to two months earlier, maybe I will have 10% deduction in the price. And when you put that in finance and Excel and you see that is not like a really small amount. So apply as soon as possible. That will be my, my end note. You're hijacking my job. You're selling the program like a professional. I mean, there's nothing to add to what you said. I mean, um... <laughs> no, it's just my experience, really. Oh. If anybody wants to ask me, like on LinkedIn, uh, how was our summer module? Because I just started. I finished my first uh, first summer module and successfully my first exam period, which I was really happy about, especially because my shadow is quite dense. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me and ask any kind of question. And we'll be meeting in two weeks. The next module will take place at the end of October. Correct. Um, in Vienna, um, yeah. The next module. I mean, you um, you mentioned so many good points. I mean, you're flattering the professors that are um, who are watching uh, the the open day right now. Since you mentioned, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you mentioned the the quality of our professors. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned again diversity and the different backgrounds in class, and I think this is an again. Um, it's not just a marketing, you know, catchphrase for us diversity. It's not for us, you know, to print colorful brochures. It's it's an advantage. It's added value for the participants if they're exposed to new approaches and different perspectives. It's where the learning kicks in. It's where you actually learn. If you're in, if you're in a group uh, based in a group with only uh, 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 people coming from the same industry from the same country. There's not much to learn, to be honest, but if you're placed in a group with people coming from the other end of the world, literally, um, coming from a completely different industry with completely new approaches, this is where you start learning how people, you know, solve ideas and solve problems and, and create ideas um, differently, Correct, yeah. maybe better to, to, or just differently to how you are um, um, coming up with those ideas. Will they have uh, like just 30 seconds more just to mention something that I experienced sure, today? Great. Yeah, uh, today, because I'm in Vienna at the moment, uh, I was in your library. So I want to say what 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 uh, some of the things that I wasn't aware because it's really huge. It's hard to grasp like what you're doing it uh, the multiple times. So library is one of the best I was in, like in Europe. So it, it's really well equipped. And uh, that is one another benefit. And uh, I didn't know that you have a career advising uh, department. So this is pretty cool as well. If you're um, doing an MBA because you want to change into another career, you can have a free one-to-one -one consulting uh, when you get enrolled uh, with uh, the top professionals. Uh, the, the boss is actually from the US. So that is like quite, it was quite interesting to me. And uh, for example, yesterday we had a fireside uh, chat with, uh, with uh, the ecosystem enabler uh, from Israeli, Tel Aviv. Uh, her name is um, yeah, Hamdat Sagi, and uh, she actually talked about how the startup nation in Israel is started. So you have all this like additional thing that you can uh, utilize. And also I want to say thank you for keeping up the safety measures on the topest level during our Budapest uh, module. So if you're concerned about that, for example, in our cohort, 
I think that uh, 95% of people were on site. So even the people from US and uh, Canada and from uh, uh, East Russia, they flew in to the Budapest and uh, the safety measures were, were just uh, uh, on top. So you don't have to worry about that. And if you want to do it remotely, there is always an option to do so. So thank you. I'm, I already received a question about the COVID measures. I will uh, keep that question. Mm -hmm. Q&A session because it, it's basically the elephant in the room that is always being asked. Um, awesome. Thank you, Anita. Thank, thank you, you so much for uh, joining us tonight and uh, uh, for being available. I want to move on to uh, Professor Miklos Koren now, who's um, our VIP of tonight, delivering a keynote presentation on expat managers in international trade. As you can see from the slide that he's uh, sharing right now, he's a PhD from Harvard. Um, before he worked at Princeton and the New York FedEx Fed. Um, he's the founder of the Business Analytics Master's Program and the CEO Microdata Research Group. His re research focuses on international trade and economic development, and he publishes regularly in leading international academic journals. He's participated in numerous international research projects, including, including a large scale uh, starting grant of the Euro European Research Council. Uh, Miklos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Thomas. And it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk to you about my, uh, my research. So this research is about the role of expatriate managers in international trade. And I think it very nicely connects to, to some of the points raised by Anita and Agnes about uh, the importance of interacting with people from other countries and other other cultures and this is based on joint work uh, with colleagues Christina Orban and Amos Talagdi and just to give you a bit of, of motivation of why we are doing this let, let me tell you a, a story from the Budapest uh, real estate market so um, and this is a real estate development project in um, very close to downtown Budapest. This tower is one of the actually the first skyscraper, proper skyscraper in Budapest. Now it's already twice the height that in the picture that started out as a Qatari investment uh, project. And even though it's a big project by uh, Budapest standards, it's a small investment um, for the Qatari investor group. And so they didn't really send anyone um, to be resident in Budapest with this project. They had some meetings, but, but no regular presence. And pretty much over the years, it turned out that it's very difficult to, to get things done. It, I mean, in, in real estate, um, you probably have to be, have to be there to, to make important decisions. And so eventually they decided to withdraw and then, and then uh, sell the project. So in what we're trying to do in this, um, in this research is to think about this idea of, of you know, face-to-face -face interaction with others, why is it important uh, in, a, um, in, a statistical, in a statistical way. So the specific questions we are asking is what roles do expatriate managers play in foreign direct investment and in international trade also. Um, so if, if if in a foreign direct investment project, there's an acquisition, how does this firm start behaving differently after being acquired? And how do they change the, the patterns of trade, the countries that they, that they trade with? And our particular approach is a, I already mentioned, it's a very statistical data-driven approach because we think, and it's also very much in line with the uh, mission of the executive MBA that you know, the kind of stories that I showed you at the beginning are, you know, important to get some ideas, but they might not capture the full story. It might be biased because some stories are easier to remember than others. Uh, so it's important to look at the full data to get to get the full picture. So we are actually, we have put together for this research um, a big data set on, on uh, managers. So we have administrative data on the universe of Hungarian corporations. It's an exhaustive data set about a million companies, including private businesses. Um, 
and all their all their company representatives, including CEOs. So there are uh, there are about two million CEOs represented in our in our data set. So um, you know, other than relative to to research on say American public corporations, this is actually a much bigger chunk of data, not just not just the size of the data, but but really representing different types of firms, which I think is very, very important. And so we can then match financial uh, information on these companies to the um, to their CEOs, and also importantly, trade transactions. There is a little bit of a limitation in, in, in our data collection, because once uh, Hungary joined the EU in 2004, then uh, trade data started we started to collect trade data in a different way um and so um we basically had to stop this part of the research in in 2003 but we are you know adding more and more data in later years and, and looking at what ha what's happening in later years but all the trade numbers i'm showing you are basically uh from the 1990s so then we are looking at, we're doing basically a statistical analysis of all the foreign acquisitions of firms that are more than 20, uh, 20 employees and that are not in the financial sector. Okay. So we have some sample definitions, but it's, it's really still a lot of, um, uh, we have over 20,000 firms, uh, even in this limited sample. And just to give you a sense of, you know, where do these investments come from and where do managers come from? Uh, here I created a map of the biggest um, investment partners of Hungary in, in the 1990s. So remember, this is the uh, limited time period. And maybe not surprisingly, um, Austria and Germany are actually the biggest um, partners in terms of FDI, also in, in, in trade. And that's very natural, you know, because of historical ties and geographic proximity with Austria, but also, uh, you know, the the big um, economic weight of Germany. But maybe more interestingly, if you look at the neighboring countries, of course, um, geographic proximity is important, but it's not everything. So if you go to, to neighboring countries, there's actually much less of an investment from those countries. There's more investment from Italy, for example, or from France and from the UK. Um, but so these are basically the, um, so we're, we're looking at these investments and we're looking at the variation in, in, in we're gonna compare German investment to French investment to, um, to Italian investment and see how these firms are behaving differently. So I mentioned that that um, you know firms might behave differently after they acquire their their target. So the context again is Hungary. So they are acquiring a Hungarian uh, company in the 1990s. So typically these are mostly uh, industrial companies. Not all of them, but that was the typical acquisition target in the 1990s. Later in the 2000s, there are more service companies being acquired. Uh, and so we have uh, 1,700, 1,800 of them that are being acquired. Um, and many of them, actually, most of them replace the, the management team, right? If you, if you have a new acquisition, you want to make changes in the company, uh, and you reshuffle the management team. But not all of those managers that you bring in are, are going to be expatriate managers who are the interest of our, of our research. So about half of the time, um, you do replace the management team, but you hire local Hungarian, Hungarian managers. How do we know that? Because we basically see the names and, and home addresses of, of managers, I won't be able to reveal them, of course, because of privacy uh, concerns. But for research purposes and aggregating them into into these broad categories, we can ask this question: is that half of the firms hire a new Hungarian manager, and half of them hire foreign managers or experts. And so, uh, what? how do we compare these different these different managers and so here i made up some names for you just to illustrate our methodology 
uh, while at the same time protect the privacy of individuals who are actually in the data set. So let's say we have a manager called Fioretta Lucchese, who is from Italy. So this is from based on the address and you know this is the name. And then we look at both the address and also the name to infer that they have um, they have an address in Italy. So um, so the country address matches up Italy. Um, the country language is Italian. Um, and we also infer from the name that, that this sounds like an Italian name. So the manager language is also Italian because it's not obvious that you, you, you know, the address and the uh, language of the manager match up. You know, here we, we have this example of, of Claudia Wolf from Germany. Um, so she has all of these indicators for Germany, much like um, you know, the Italian case that I explained, but actually some of these language benefits might kind of spill over to Austria or Switzerland or other German speaking countries because they are sharing uh, a, common, a common language. But another example that I already alluded to is that you might be a resident of Germany, yet your name might suggest that you actually speak, you know, maybe in addition to German, you speak Italian. And so then in that case, actually, the language spoken by the manager is, is kind of separate from the language of the country where they're from. Um, so this is actually interesting for us because it, it can help us distinguish different stories for why, um, you know, having an expatriate manager presence in the company might be, might be important. Do they bring their, their cultural knowledge with them? So I'll, I'll do a bit more speculation about this after I, I show you some statistical results. So basically what we do is take this company that, that is being overtaken and then we do a, an event study. Actually in finance, this is very, uh, it's a very popular statistical methodology. Something happens in the life of the company. Uh, let's look at stock returns before and stock returns after. The exception here is the, the difference here is that we're not looking at stock returns. Here we're looking at exporting behavior. So um, what is the probability that you become an exporter in, in, in a given year? And um, these are the years before the acquisition and these are the years after the acquisition. Um, and so we see that both for firms that are acquired and also for firms that replace their manager, the probability of exporting increases um, and in particular, it increases in the country where the owner is from, so that's the red line, or where the manager is from, that's the blue line. And there might be a little bit higher effect for managers, but this is a quantitatively pretty, pretty big effect. Remember, these are all the corporations, not just large public corporations, including uh, smaller private establishments. So not many of them export. So if you can increase the export probability by by five percent, that's actually a big, a big effect. Uh, if anything, there's an even stronger effect on importing. So importing probability goes up by fifteen percent if you hire a manager from that country. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we try to um, disentangle these these effects and, and separate them into the different different layers, if you like. So here, let me do this for the import effect, but you can, and, and the results are very similar for the export effect as well. Is what is the contribution of you know coming from the same country? So um, remember our, our managers; some of them are come from Germany. Then you know they are. Uh, six percentage point more likely to export to Germany. Uh, what is the contribution of sharing a common language with the country? There's a little bit of extra contribution, so they might be a little bit more likely to export to Austria because there's a common language. Uh, and actually even bigger contribution for the manager language. So if this is a German manager from with an Italian uh, name, then there's this benefit for exporting to Italy. 
as well. So this is actually helpful in, in disentangling the different stories. It's probably not only a language story because the direct language effect is, 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 is rather small and it's not very expensive to hire translators and, and the like. So it's, it's probably more than just a pure, pure language uh, story. So we, we're really thinking about um, three explanations and we're doing more uh, deeper statistic analysis to to um, to discuss these explanations. So one is really integrating the company into into the global supply chain, um, and within the global sub supply chain, really everything is happening within your supply chain: importing, exporting, the internal labor market of managers. So that's basically one interpretation: is that if you become part of factory Germany then then uh, we're going to see it in in all aspects of the company another and, and i think from the kind of data that we have it's actually very different difficult to tell apart explanation number two and explanation number three one is kind of a professional network that if i have a manager who has uh, you know a lot of experience doing business in germany then they have built their network um, and then you can learn from them and, and how to export to this market or how to trade with the market. And you, you, you can rely on the exact network that they brought with them. Uh, the other is, I think, is a little bit softer. And, you know, here's something that we can allude to that we very much hope that this is also happening at the uh, executive MBA classroom is that if you come from a particular uh, market and you understand the business culture in that market, then you can actually um, enable your business to connect better with, with other people who are familiar with that, with that business culture. Um, and so these are, I think, you know, maybe not very surprising uh, explanations, but we are the, I would say, one of the first studies to have a statistical uh, evidence on the importance of these business culture and, and professional network mechanisms. So thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Miklos. I'm pretty sure that um, our faculty director, Maciej Kieślowski, has a question for you. Yes, good evening, uh, everybody, and good evening, Miklos. This is such a fascinating piece of research, precisely because, you know, it shows things, you know, we, we can say beyond reasonable doubt that, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, the thing that, you know, um, is, is perhaps somewhat sad for us in the EMBA for the open world, yes, because it uh, uh, can, kind of, it, it does look that, um, that, that, uh, business is done in those little bubbles or that, that are determined by nationality and, uh, and language. Mm, uh, do you have any, you know, just like getting a sense from the data and just like working on this topic for a long time, do you have any uh, sense of what we can do to kind of facilitate the same type of trust and connections, uh, you know, beyond those bubbles, yes? In other words, how to make your uh, what you're finding less relevant for the future, yes? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I think one one thing I can say to that is, is you know, we want to know, right? Even if even if there's a lot, still a lot of um, role for personal connections. I, you know, this doesn't mean that you know deals are being done in smoke filled rooms or or anything. It's just that there's some role for for you know sharing a business culture or having having these networks. Um, and I think it's 
also highlights some of the limitation of, of this kind of statistical work because we can talk about what we can measure and what we can measure is, is you know, your, your work experience in other countries or, you know, the fact that you have lived in other countries because you have a foreign address. Yes, no, I, I, I mean, this is, this, is, this is, I think, really, really interesting that, uh, f- f- first of all, I mean, it, it very strongly, if indirectly, shows the importance of trust and, and tacit knowledge, yes, in, 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 and so, so, uh, so I, 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 I do think that um, logically, if you kind of think about the sense of process that you are describing, um, uh, international education, strong alumni uh, bonds, and other um, uh, kind of s- things that would work in a similar way as what you measure, uh, you know, are likely candidates for things that, uh, that, that can offset uh, or compensate for this effect, right? Yeah, so I, I agree. So we would have to really uh, understand better the mechanism, like why, yeah. uh, and I think trust, and that's a great example that might be, uh, that might be an important mechanism. So this was actually uh, something that we learned from um, uh, last year's cohorts of, of MBA students. We had, uh, you know, when, when COVID hit and we had a, um, a great discussion with us. So we had a seminar about our COVID-related research and how online um, and working from home, how that might reshape uh, businesses in the longer run. And, and very, very strong feedback was from practically everyone is that you can do business at a distance up to some point, but to build trust, you really need face-to-face meetings. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so maybe... Yeah, so, so, tell, so like we could expect that the... If you did this study in the COVID world, the results would be even stronger, right? Because I think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so so this is. Uh, the, I, I I I think I think in many ways, uh, you know, understanding that we are, you know, that that, that this is needed for, for 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 businesses. That like we can't just assume it away in some sort of you know globalization, uh, you know, daydreaming. Uh, is, 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 is incredibly important and incredibly profound. Mm, you know, even, even, even if it kind of, you know, doesn't portray the world as like, you know, full of completely open opportunities for, for, for everybody and for completely based on meritocracy, right? I think there, yeah, there is a sense in which, you know, more and more globalization created this uh, this sense that it's a small world and you know you can connect to everyone. Um, information technologies have had that that sense, but uh, you know I, I think it's important to highlight that personal personal links are still very important. So mobility of people, um, meeting meeting people uh that's just very important so uh distance has not distance has not um gone away yeah uh it's in- very interesting because this is this is an israeli week uh, for CEO executive mba yesterday we had a fireside hour our distinguished uh, practitioner series and we had a uh, uh, as the name of the series suggests, very distinguished practitioner Hamdat Sagi from uh, from Tel Aviv, from uh, from uh, innovation hub of uh, of Volkswagen, and um, uh, and um, and and you know, and and Hamdat was telling you know in and her little story a very similar story, right, Thomas? Sorry, I was muted. Exactly. So, so basically, so basically, uh, trust and uh, and, uh, and 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 specific culture uh, is 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 important because, like, I I guess uh, economists would say it they lower transaction costs, right, <laughs> Nicholas? Yeah, but so I think 
it's important to dig deeper and see what are those transaction transaction costs. They are not like monetary costs. So, so you know, what does trust mean for for globalization? Uh, why, you know, what's the role for sharing language? As I mentioned, it's really the effects are just way too big to be explained away by by pure transaction costs. Hey, I have to hire an interpreter to be to be able to interact with Italians. There's definitely more more to it than that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, 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 thank you so much, uh, Miklos. It's always such a pleasure to 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 listen to to about your new research and uh, and and I'm also uh, happy, although not surprised, that that this is this this kind of findings because of how rigorous they are and like because this is more so much more than the, that an opinion really kind of are great to start a discussion in an EMBA classroom because, because people can then build on it. And of course, conclusions, uh, you know, as uh, we call in science, external validity is always much more speculative, but at least you, said you have a very rigorous foundation from which you build those uh, conclusions and, uh, and, uh, and, and implications, right? Uh, thank you much. I thank you for the, uh, for having me. Thank you very uh, much, Miklos. In view of the time, we need to move on to the Q and A session, which I promised that I would collect questions from the audience, which I did in the meantime. And Maciej and I will be happy to answer those questions. Um, the first question that I noted for you, Maciej, is the elephant in the room. I already mentioned it um, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, COVID measures, co COVID safety on campus. Can you please talk about that issue? Yes. Uh, so we are um, offering an online option, but as the name suggests, it's an option. And we have consistently throughout this pandemic uh, did everything in our power to keep the on site as a rule and online as a necessary exception. We, I've, I, I'm happy to say we are quite successful in this. Since the start of the pandemic, we have just, we had just one online, fully online module when it was like legally impossible, uh, and we didn't have any COVID infections uh, on campus because we do a lot of testing. Everybody uh, who comes to campus, even vaccinated people, uh, are asked to go for a quick antigen every second day. Uh, it's free, it's available. It gives everybody peace of mind. Um, we have uh, serious distancing measures, which are very difficult and costly for us, but we are doing them anyways. Um, for example, we split classes sometimes into two groups, um, uh, basically doubling the faculty so that people can be physically distant. Uh, so so we, run, we run a very safe program, which is however, because of the nature of what you were describing, Thomas, it's, it's, still, uh, it, it's still a mainly on-site program. Yes, we, uh, and, 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 and people come, uh, uh, people travel. There is always an element of risk, but I have I have a sense that th th now that we are kind of moving into this situation, I hate to call it new normal, but you know, let's call it a situation in which we 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 we, we don't have a, like a, a way to eradicate this disease in the in the near term. I think what is going on in our heads. Um, mm, uh, you know, maybe Miklos should uh, should do another study about this. Is we are starting to prioritizing in our lives things that will move online and things that need to stay on site because we lose so much. And 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 I think more and more we will be doing those trade offs. And I think a, a, a kind of personalized, high you know, high quality, high touch. American style MBA is that kind of a program, uh, that's kind of a priority where 
think people will continue to do it do it on site i think the the, the takeaway is that um, we encourage everybody to come on site um, because it's the best learning experience of course you can do it online but an executive mba is more than just watching a zoom video or watching a youtube video about finance let's say it's about interaction in class it's about the networking part it's about having drinks after after class it's about having lunch together it's about interaction in class all that social uh, uh, interaction that is going on beside the actual uh, uh, teaching and, and learning part um, the next question is about the application process and the apl application requirements which I'm uh, I'd be happy to to take um, the application process is pretty straightforward you just go to our completely new redesigned website, start your application there. Um, you upload your documents. Um, we require a CV, a motivation letter, university diploma and transcript, um, and two references. You upload those documents. And once your application documents have been finalized and sub submitted, completed and submitted, um, we will check them, of course, for completeness. And you will be invited for an interview with one of our faculty members. And based on a fixed uh, questionnaire, you will be assessed. Um, um, we're not playing mind games during the um, interview. Um, it's just an interview in order to get to know your motivation, in order to get to know you as a person um, beside the CV. Um, and uh, based on that um, interview, you will receive an admission decision that um, will express um, if you're uh, being accepted to the program or not. The requirements can be uh, seen on our website. It's it's pretty clear. We It's an executive MBA. We require at least eight years of work experience, of which um, at least a three, of, of which a, at least three years of managerial or some kind of leadership experience. Um, we require an, an the, uh, graduate degrees from university, no matter what the, uh, the field of study was. Um, proficiency in English is required, and that's basically the um, the, the, the formal criteria. Um, um, the next question that I noted is about if there are any exams and if there's a thesis, Maciej. So, um, there is no thesis. Instead of a thesis, we have a capstone. Um, a capstone is an integrative project um, overseen by our uh, faculty member, Mike Labelle, uh, that is aimed at you applying what you have learned at CU Executive MBA to real world. And uh, by that, we mean two things. There is the so-called strategic analysis component, which is you apply frameworks and tools of analysis that we taught you which is an important part of, of, the, of the program. But also there is a leadership component in which you apply uh, the skills uh, and abilities that you have acquired um, in terms of your, your, your leadership abilities and um, change management abilities. So like we, we actually ask you as part of our thesis to actually change something in the world. Um, however uh, small it may be, but it can be also big and, and ambitious. Examples include mentoring somebody and helping somebody, you know, turn a corner professionally uh, or implementing a project. Sometimes people do it in sequence. They do a strategic analysis component first, and then they apply it uh, or oversee its execution in a company or in a think tank or um, you know in a, in a non-profit organization um, uh, uh, as a leadership component. So that that's um, that's the capstone. Exams. I know Thomas would remind me about the second part of the question, so I am not going to let him do this. And exams uh, uh, happen. Uh, but very, I think very interestingly, we completely uh, offloaded exams from the modules. So like the idea is 
it's very precious time when like everybody comes or joins online for these four or nine day modules. And this is a time to exchange ideas, you know, to talk with Miklos about the role of trust and tacit knowledge in business relations or things like that. Um, and, um, and, and, and exams are done online after the module. After the module, yeah, I just wanted to add, we're not wasting your time during the module with you know sitting in class, sitting, doing exams. Um, once the module is done, you will travel home and you have a time frame of, uh, I think it's two weeks, about two weeks where you can do the um, online exam and you can do it at your convenience. You can do it at night, you can do it during work, you can do it on the weekends. Um, whenever it pleases you, you can do the online exam. Of course, once you start the exam, you need to finish it. I mean, that's just, I think that's uh, clear to say. Um, in view of the time, I would like to finalize the open day with the last and maybe most important question about financial support and scholarships available, which I, I'm happy to take this question. Um, we offer, we're happy to offer a, a variety of financial support. Um, scholarships and fellowships are part of our DNA and not just charity that we give away because we want to empower, we want to encourage people who wouldn't be able to participate in such a program. Um, that's why we're offering basically three streams of financial support. The first one is the Open World uh, Scholarship, which aims at people who are doing something professional, professionally or, you know, Uh, 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 whatever the profession is, something aligned with our mission, you know, um, the open society approach, um, questioning dogmas, questioning hierarchies. Um, in most cases, it affects people coming from the humanitarian field, but it does not uh, exclude people coming from the corporate world. Um, the second stream of scholarships is the need-based scholarships, which solely take into consideration your income situation and the country of your residence, because the same position might have uh, different levels of income um, if you're based in Germany or in Ukraine, for example. And the third um, uh, stream of financial support are the country-specific merit-based uh, scholarships. They're um, available, visible on our website, again, because we have so many of them. They're country-specific. We have, for example, a Central European a uh, fellowship for Romani managers. We have an international fellowship for uh, managers with a disability. We have um, uh, certain um, uh, fellowships for business women in Russia, uh, Turkey, etc. And we have an international LGBTIQ uh, fellowship, etc., etc. You need to look up where you're coming from on our website and if there is a specific um, fellowship that suits you. Of course, you can also book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me using that link that I just shared. And I will be happy to advise you on our scholarship options. So you don't have to look up, uh, you, you don't have to search for them our website. I'd be happy to advise them, advise you on our scholarships. Um, in view of the time, it's uh, 7.15 in Central Europe. It's 8.15 in Tel Aviv. I would like to conclude and thank everybody for joining us tonight. I would like to uh, thank Miklos and Mace from the academic side for joining us tonight. I would like to thank uh, Agnes and Anita from, from the students and alumni part um, for joining us tonight. And thank you, the participants, the attendees for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me and let's take it from there. Good night from Tel Aviv. <laughs>